I have set aside my series in 2 Thessalonians. I would normally have been on 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, but I have set it aside for a special resurrection sermon <laughs> that we're going to look at today. Okay? All right, but first, as usual, Pastor Herrick has his, tries to have his, what he thinks is, what he thinks is humorous anecdote in the morning. I got, I got some of those silly jokes again. Why did the unemployed man look into his Bible? He thought there was a job in there for him. A job. J-O-B in there for him. I know. When was meat first mentioned in the Bible? Noah took ham into the ark. Uh, What's the best way to study the Bible? You look into it. I know, I know. But I like these, these, uh, these dumb ones. The dumber they are, the better they are. I think I got one more. Where is medicine first mentioned in the Bible? Oh, when God gave Moses two tablets, like the doctor, take two tablets and call me in the morning. Huh? God gave him two tablets. All right, let's look into our text for this day. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, we're going to look at verses 1 through 5. Okay, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Finally, brothers, interesting, there's three chapters when he comes to the beginning of chapter 3, he says, finally, brothers, and he is, he's closing out with the last things here. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be, and be honored as happened among you and, that you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing and will do the things that we commanded. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to be, and to the, there's our word, remember the whole theme of 2 Thessalonians, and to, and to the steadfastness of Christ. All right. You say, what does this passage have to do with the resurrection? Pastor Eric, you're trying to pull something over on us. You're continuing in your series on 2 Thessalonians and trying to pass it off as some kind of resurrection sermon. Well, that's what I'm doing, yes. That's exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> this passage has to do with the effect of the gospel on the lives of the Thessalonian believers. Without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the gospel would have been of no effect whatsoever. So, Though the resurrection is not stated here in this passage, this passage has everything to do with the power of the resurrection. The power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the power that is effecting and changing the Thessalonians' lives. So it is a message about the resurrection. Here's a cross-reference. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. You dumb Thessalonians, why are you believing in this Jesus fella? It's causing you persecution. It's causing you a bunch of trouble when he really didn't even raise from the dead. Well, that's if Paul is arguing there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 15, if Jesus had, some were trying to say that, there was no resurrection. Jesus had not been resurrected. The Christian faith would be in vain. He says in verse 17, I skipped a few verses, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. But as he argues in that passage, Jesus Christ was resurrected and it is the power of the resurrected Jesus Christ that can change and affect people's lives. All right, here's another cross-reference. 
excuse me, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19, 20, and 21. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places. So he's talking about the power that God used to raise Jesus Christ from the dead. He says, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. The power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is the same power that lives in us as believers today. That's my theme throughout this whole message. We sang, we, I meant to sing this song. I had a different one on there. But the same power, I love this song. I wish I'd have had the right one on, <laughs> on there. But the one we sang was good. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave, the same power that commands the dead to wake, lives in us lives in us. The same power that moved mountains when he speaks, the same power that can calm the raging sea, lives in us, lives in us. He lives in us. So it is a resurrection sermon. Though I continued on in 2 Thessalonians, it is a resurrection sermon because the life-changing effect that the gospel had on the Thessalonian lives was because of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so let's get into it. Here's my outline. I had an outline sheet out there with a bunch of blanks on it, and I made sure I included the resurrection in my outline. Because of the resurrection, prayer is effective. Paul is praying for the Thessalonian believers. No, he asked them to pray for him. We'll look at that. Verse 1a. Second part, because of the resurrection, God's word can spread. Paul traveled around and he'd preach and people would have their lives changed. Why? Because they believed in Jesus Christ. People were struggling. People were heartbroken. People were going through difficult times. And the gospel came to their town. And Paul preached it and they believed it. And the gospel began to cause them to be changed. Because of the resurrection, they can have protection from the evil one. We'll talk about that. Because of the resurrection, they can do right. They have the power to choose to do what, God, what Paul commanded, what the Bible commands us to do. And in part five, because of the resurrection, they can have, and we've talked about many times now because it keeps popping up in this book, the whole theme of 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians especially, is steadfastness. By the way, have you been practicing your tug-of-war? We're forming some inner church tug-of-war team. And with tug-of-war, you have to stand fast and hold firm. Remember? Same thing that Thessalonians had to do. Stand fast and hold firm. They can have steadfastness. Okay, let's jump into this. Because of the resurrection, prayer is effective. Because Jesus Christ raised from the dead, we, remember, I, I, I don't know if you watched the one on the History Channel. We watched the, the, the series on Jesus' crucifixion on the History Channel and I don't know that I trusted all of it because the producers weren't all. They had some good evangelical scholars, but they had some kind of liberal scholars on there as well. But it, it brought out the fact that, um, that when Jesus died on the cross between noon and three o'clock, he was hung on the cross at nine, was on the cross for three hours, and then at noon it was total darkness. And then Jesus spoke a number of things at the end and there was an earthquake and in the temple, the curtain, the thick, foot thick curtain that was in the temple separating the holy place from the holy of holies was ripped in half from top to bottom, making the way possible for us to come to a holy and righteous God through the death of Jesus Christ. And that enables us to have prayer. Paul says this in verse 1a. He says, finally, brothers, 
pray for us. Now, we have read a lot of prayers where Paul says, I am praying for you. And he would. He would travel around. He'd get churches planted. And as he traveled in his prayer life, he would pray for those weak, young, new Christians. But Paul faced persecution. Paul faced problems. Paul got run out of town, got thrown in jail, got beaten, got arrested. Paul needed prayer support. And Paul says to the Thessalonians, Hey, you Thessalonians, I want you to pray for me. And they had power. They had power in prayer. Those Thessalonians, I can just imagine in their service, somebody stands up and says, uh, Pastor, I think we ought to have a prayer time for the Apostle Paul. He's the one who brought us the gospel, and he's traveling around, he's preaching the gospel, and he's... he's having difficulties. He talks about his persecutors here. I think we ought to have prayer. And they got down on their knees and they prayed for Paul. Paul had asked them, brothers, pray for us. And their prayer was effective in God's eyes. <laughs> Comments on this. Jesus' death on the cross broke down the wall of sin that separated us from the holy and righteous God. I talked about that veil that was rent. Then three days later, Jesus rose from the grave and had victory over sin and Satan. We're going to talk about the evil one in a point or two. Therefore, we as believers can come to the Lord in prayer and he is willingly and he willingly hears us and gives us our requests. Isn't prayer a wonderful thing? You can take special time at the side of your bed and kneel down. You can pray while you're driving. I do that all the time. I don't know how much distractive it is. It's better than looking at my cell phone while I'm driving. I spend time in prayer. You can spend time when you're in the middle of trouble. Uh, I, I was thinking about the one thief on the cross. He said in prayer to the Lord, he did to Jesus next to him. He says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So you can pray even while you're being crucified. huh? We can pray anytime and he hears our requests. Here's a cross reference, James 5 16. Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. I, I wonder if we do that. In your prayer time do you stop and remember the various people of your local church and pray for them? We ha often have prayer requests put on, put on our, our uh, prayer. We have a prayer page on Facebook where people share needs and just the spiritual lives of, of people in our local church. We ought to pray for one another. James says, pray for one another that they may be healed. Listen to this, less, this last phrase. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Your prayer has a lot of effect before God when you bring those requests. If I pray for, and I'll just pick on Dan because I always pick on Dan because I know he won't get offended or anything. Uh, if I pray for Dan, Lord, I think you need to straighten Dan out. No, that ain't, that ain't what I pray. I, I say, Lord, help Dan, help him in his life. And the Lord hears that. And the Lord, that, that has a lot of effect with the Lord. And the Lord says, John, I, I like you to pray that because that's what I want to do anyway. I want to help Dan in his spiritual life or whoever it may be. And he says, you're praying according to my will. I'm going to answer that prayer. We need to pray for one another. You ought to sit down and make a list of everyone. You know, we're a small group. You could easily do that. Make a list and look where everyone is sitting. Those teens in the front row, pray for them. You know, uh, uh, Alan, he needs a lot of prayer over there. You know, know where everyone is sitting. And in your prayer time, pray for each other. Just like James said, pray for one another. It has a lot of power. Another cross-reference, 1 John 5. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. Pray for your pastor. Pray for, well, all of us. 
Pray for one another. All right, number two. Because of the resurrection, God's word can spread. Paul says here, finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored. In other words, people get saved as happened among you. Paul says, I'm going around, I'm bringing the gospel to this new Macedonian area that I haven't been before on the first missionary journey. I received the Macedonian call, I came to you Thessalonians, you got saved, and now I'm traveling around, I'm spreading the gospel. Pray that the gospel may spread. Isn't it interesting? It started uh, when Jesus Christ died on the cross and resurrected, there were 12 apostles, 12 disciples. Of course, there were the, the women and there were others who were the followers of Jesus as well, but it spread from little Palestine throughout the world. 300 AD, the Roman religions were dying and Constantine converted to Christianity and almost all of Rome became a Christian-filled nation. I think it's the next slide. Do I have comments before there? It's a slide that shows a video of the spread of Christianity through the world through the centuries. Oh, I, I had another verse here. I'm sorry. And that we may be delivered from the wicked and evil men, for not all have faith. Okay, watch this. Starting down there, spreading. The white is Christianity. Four hundred eighty. I hadn't realized this, how far the gospel had spread into Asia. Eight hundred eighty. Fourteen hundred AD. Spreading to the United States, South America. Paul says, pray that the gospel may spread. Now, we might think, well, the gospel has spread. It spread throughout the entire world. I want to show you the next slide. You know what these are? These little dots are all unreached people groups, missiologists, people who study missions, unreached people groups where the gospel has not come yet. So we have a responsibility. By the way, this is the last Sunday, kind of the last Sunday for our... Um, our mission, special missions offering, North American Mission Board offering, um, give to that. Give to the Lottie Moon offering at Christmas time. Am I getting my two switched around, Annie and Lottie? Uh, I think I got that right. There are unreached people groups that the gospel still needs to go to. Okay, point number three. Because of the resurrection, they can have protection from the evil one. Satan is a fallen, powerful, powerful fallen angel that is rebelling against God. Uh, other angels fell, rebelled with him as demons, and they want to stop the spread of Christianity. They want to... Uh, Mickey preached a couple weeks ago on the thief wants to come to kill, steal, and destroy. That's a good description of what Satan wants to do in people's lives. Kill, steal, and destroy. Paul says in verse 3, But the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. Here they were weak young Christians when Paul had to leave Thessalonica and they've kind of been on their own. They picked up some false teaching and Paul has straightened them out about that. And Paul wants them to be, here's our word again, steadfast. Um, 
And he is praying that the Lord will guard them against the evil one because the Lord is faithful to do that. The Lord is faithful and will guard them and protect them from Satan who wants to get into their lives, wants to get into your life and ruin your testimony, ruin your Christian life. The Lord will guard you. I looked up that Greek word. The Greek word used for guard here is uh, fulasso. I know, that's hard to say. Fulasso. It means to guard. Huh? So it's a good translation. To guard or to watch over. Uh, a couple of uh, uses for the word. The word is often used in Greek literature referring to the uninterrupted vigilance that shepherds show in keeping their flock. They guard their flock. If any animal comes out to attack a sheep, they're going to have to face that shepherd because he is guarding the flock. God, the word is used of how the Lord will guard you as a shepherd guards over the flock. It's also a word that's used about the unbroken vigilance of a military guard. If a military guard falls asleep on his watch, he is in big trouble. They need to stay awake. They need to be vigilant. They need to stand guard and watch over. That's how that word is used. It is used here of how God will guard over your spiritual life. Cross-reference, John 10.10. 10. The thief comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. In Jesus' parable there, who is the thief that's come to, coming to hurt the sheep? Well, that's what Satan wants to do in our lives. Another cross-reference, 1 John 5.12. I like this. We know that you are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. The whole world, the unsaved world, is under the authority, under the power of the evil one, Satan. But in 1 John 2.14, John writes this, I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of the Lord abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. You have resisted his temptations in his life. You have set practices of godliness in your life. And you have overcome the evil one in your life. That's what we need to use. We need to use the power of the resurrection in our lives to defeat Satan's temptations on us. Point number four, because of the resurrection, they can do right. Paul says here, and we have confidence in the Lord about you, that you are doing and will do the things that we commanded. Because of the resurrection, we have the power to resist temptations and to do what is right. Cross-reference here, 2 Peter 1.3, his divine power. His divine power, there it is, that power, that same power that rose Jesus from the grave. His divine power granted to us all things, all things, let me repeat, wait a minute, my eyes, I can't quite see it. What does that word say? All things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. Do you see what that verse says? That verse says that you as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ have the power, have everything, have everything necessary to live a life of godliness. Oh, oh, this sin is in my life and I get tempted and I fall and I just, I just can't help it. I fail. Peter says you have the power to overcome that sin in your life. You have been granted all things that pertain to life and godliness. We have the power to overcome them in our life. We just need to use it. All right, another cross-reference. Romans 6, 9 through 12. Yeah, Romans 6, wonderful passage. 
we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, there it is, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Huh? There's a resurrection verse. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but, li but the life he lives, he lives to God. So, here's an application now to us. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now this is very practical. You go home this afternoon and you're sitting there and your mind begins to pick up some temptation thoughts. Maybe lust. Maybe you, oh boy, I ought to go do, you know, whatever it is. Here, Paul says, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that you have, and you are to consider yourself dead to that sin. You say, no, I don't need to sin. I'm dead to that sin. That sin, I'm, I, I, I died to that old way of life. I've been resurrected to, new, uh, to a new way of life in Jesus Christ, and that sin has no power over me. Get behind me, evil one. Get out of my life, you sin, because I am dead to you and alive to Jesus Christ. All right. Let not sin, therefore, reign rule in your mortal bodies to make you obey its passion. Don't let it reign. Point number five. Because of the resurrection, they can have steadfastness. We've talked about that word. It says, may the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. And being stable, strong, steadfast in their Christian life. Cross-reference, Philippians 1, 6. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you. Think of those Thessalonians. Paul came and preached the gospel. They believed in Jesus Christ. Instantaneously, God reached down regenerated their heart, gave them the Holy Spirit, and began to do a work in them. You know what that implies? That means that God has a special purpose, a work for your life. And Paul says here in Philippians, I am sure that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. God is going to continue to work in your Christian life. One more cross-reference. I know, I'm doing all kinds of cross Where? What chapter in Jude? I didn't put the chapter up there in Jude. I just put the verses. Ah. Jude only has one chapter, so you don't include chapter 1 in there. But Jude, verses 24 and 25, Paul says this. This is one of the, not Paul, Jude says this. This is a closing, kind of a closing benediction that he has. He says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory and exceeding, with exceeding joy to the only wise God and Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Notice that first part. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling. God has the power in your life available to you so that you can walk steadfast in your Christian life. Paul wanted these Thessalonians to be steadfast. He wants us to be steadfast, faithful, unswerving in our Christian lives. Why? Because of the power that we have through the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, conclusion. The power of the resurrection, Jesus Christ lives in us. We have the power to share the gospel. It will spread. We have power to resist the evil one. We have the power to do what is right. And my last point, we have the power to be steadfast in our Christian lives. I have a closing song that we will sing as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's table. We'll be coming to the Lord's table immediately after that song. Would a couple of you like to go?